thank you very much for coming along again this evening. This evening, we're going to look back over the last couple of months and, in fact, examine whether we've been up against a strange phenomena or what's going to become a more regular phenomenon. That is, high tide, high seas, and winter storms. The convergence of those three things. Now, that's been something that is not a surprise to New England. Nor'easters are a regular feature of the northeastern part of the country. That's where they get their terminology. They're also a predictable characteristic of the tropical air moving northward. And in warmer periods, those are cyclonic and become hurricanes. In colder periods, they just are big storms moving heat from the tropics toward the poles. And the convergence of any two of those storms, or more, and the increase in sea level rise can make storm surge a major problem. That's what's happened several times in the last month. Now, Boston can actually be pretty proud of what it's done to prepare for these things. More than most cities, it's actually been advised by scientists and concerned citizens for quite a while. So much so that it called itself Climate Ready, developed a report called Climate Ready Boston, and we'll look at that history of its development a bit. But it was still caught by surprise in the last few months. One of its underscoring is Boston's urgent struggle to face the challenge of a changing climate. It's not just storm surge, which is the way it first expresses itself, but in fact it's storm surge on top of sea level rise. So that's what we're going to look at today. We saw it pretty dramatically, scenes from things like the Boston Herald. Nancy Lane took this one for the Boston Herald, and people were being helped out of flooding situations down in, on uh, Long Wharf and Atlantic Avenue. It was pretty extraordinary. And Michelle Wu, one of the Boston City Councilors, in fact, the chair of it for a while, uh, was quite nervous about this whole prospect. As this long winter chock full of historic storms finally draws to a close, city councillors are starting to look for solutions to what they say is one of the most critical threats facing Boston, flooding. We've had two once in a hundred year storms in the last month. City councillor Michelle Wu is calling for a concrete plan to protect Boston neighborhoods from future flood damage after nor'easters walloped the city throughout the winter. Throughout Boston, this is going to be an issue. There will be tremendous costs. How do we plan to pay for it? She echoes concerns from people on the ground like real estate developer Mark Savatsky, who renovates homes in East and South Boston. A plan is great, but a budget is better because a budget leads to action. Savatsky said in these neighborhoods, he's seen the flood map grow and grow. We're starting to look towards the future and make sure we're building is going to stand the test of time. Scientists predict that city sea levels, which have risen about nine inches in the last century, will continue to rise at a faster pace painting a very different picture of how Boston could look. So, that's the question. Sea level rise has risen about nine inches in the last century. But what's coming is at a faster pace because it's an exponential process. So the flooding is going to be more frequent and more severe with the same fixed installations and in infrastructure and hardened defenses against the ocean. They're not going anywhere. But the sea level is rising, and the storm surges on top of that are going to be more severe. So <clears throat> there is an understanding here of what's coming, basically flooding in these areas that are very prone to sea level rise all of these areas prone to sea level rise, but storm surge on top of it 
reaching major areas in Boston. And that means in the near future, neighborhoods like South Boston, which is dangerously exposed to storm surge and high tides, could regularly experience nor'easter level flooding. You know, once every other week on average in four decades or so. In four decades, once every other week. Not once or twice a year. Once every other week in four decades, so 2000. 60, let's say, according to this estimate. Whether this whether it in fact happens quicker than that is what we're going to be watching very carefully. Shins are a $20 billion sea barrier under review by UMass Boston or multi-million dollar onshore developments. The stormy winter has spurred action in the city. It isn't a long-term risk anymore. It really has arrived. We're living in this phase of an ocean that's really on the move. Each of these nor'easters that has happened just this very season has broken records. Boston is really seeing that impact right now. For the Boston Herald, Megan Adelini. Okay, well you can see one of the problems right there in Megan's report. Uh, by problems, I mean one of the structural problems. It's not a, um, an event that's a problem. It's a pattern of events. And the pattern of events is quite clear. See the grain? These are newly constructed buildings. In fact, brand new, not even finished. And they're right there at sea level. That's a structural problem, right? Because sea level is not going the other way. It's not as if someone can pull the plug on the ocean and have it drain out this point. And yet you're building in new infrastructure and new megastructures for residents, business, and the like, all of which will require fresh water, power, and the full gamut of urban services, like sewer for example. Where are you going to put sewer here in such a way that it can in fact, evacuate the building. The cranes are so busy down in the seaport area in South Boston that it's hard to uh, keep track of them all. In any case, this is the kind of structural problem that we're going to see more and more of. And Michel Wu, as city councilor, in fact, chair of the housing committee, has looked into this at great length. Ever since Hurricane Sandy, East Coast cities, Boston among them, have been alerted to the need to develop resilience as an aspect of their future planning. Mayor Menino recognized this a while ago and said, listen, we need a plan, and started to develop one. He appointed a Green Ribbon Commission of very senior business executives and top officials in the government to try to figure out in a Green Ribbon Commission, what would be the best strategy here? Under the leadership of Amos Hostetter and others, there was really quite an extraordinary plan drawn up, a preventive and anticipatory plan issued first as <coughs> Climate Ready Boston in 2013 by Mayor Menino. It was a, an official publication of a group called Green of Eight Boston which was emerging from the Green Ribbon Commission. It's been updated since by the current mayor, Marty Walsh, and it's been republished and recast with a bigger scope and ambition in 2016, three years after the first one. This was called the final report. You can see here down at Columbus Park, Long Wharf, and the Boston skyline behind it, but this is the park that, in fact, was inundated, inundated rather quickly during this last series of Nor'easterns. Austin Blackmon has been uh, appointed by the mayor as the head of environment and energy, and he's often the spokesman on a lot of these issues. In fact, the first modern scientific studies about the impact of climate change and sea level rise in Boston started over a decade and a half ago. 
This is not just since Tomanino. Tomanino was brought to the issue by a group of scientists who started to look at it back in 2005. We've all known about the vulnerability of Boston since its inception, but in 2003, 4, and 5, there were some simulations done about what sea level would look like if there were a northeast storm or a hurricane that overtopped the Charles River Dam. Well, the flooding is pretty extensive all of Back Bay, Boston University, MIT, Harvard Science Museum, everything, uh, basically underwater, according to this scenario back in 2003. And it was enough to stimulate a study, very interestingly, put out with a media summary, so the media could understand it, a long study called Climate's Long-Term Impacts on Metro Boston. The phrase in here now that seems odd is long term, because it's become a lot shorter term. The person who undertook it was at the time an engineer at Tufts. Boston is the focus of a first ever report out today, looking at the possible impact of global warming of a major U.S. city. Now it's important to capture the beginning phraseology of that report, because it's absolutely staggering to think that this was what it was, the first major study. Boston is the focus of a first ever report out today looking at the possible impact of global warming of a major U.S. city. The research, funded by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, was conducted by scientists at Tufts, Boston University, and the University of Maryland. Okay. Now, in fact, the report came out on the 13th of August, 2004, 14 years ago. What's so staggering about it, not only was it supported by the EPA, right, but that it was the first ever study. We've known that Boston is this close to sea ever since its first mapping, right? Jim Hansen announced that sea level rise is likely to be an outcome of what he regarded as the clear signal of global warming in 1988. It wasn't until 2004 that there was an EPA commissioned report to look at what could be the possible impact of sea level rise on a first major American city. Pretty staggering. Let's hear it again. It's just. It's an amazing historical document. Let's try it. The study was by, among other things, Paul Kirschen from Tufts University at the time. And he's interviewed by Fred Tice on WBUR at that point. We're having trouble calling up from the archives. In fact, it was reported on in 2005, after the report came out in 2004. Um, and Paul Kirschen was the backbone to the study very important engineer at the time, civil engineer at Tufts University. He also did things for Somerville Public Television. Take a look. Changes in rainfall patterns will be one of the most difficult challenges, as demonstrated by the intense storms and roadway flooding that Somerville experienced in 2010. We're going to have an increased average rainfall. Now, it's not, that doesn't create so much of a problem by itself. We're also going to have more uh, intense storms. We're going to see a lot more local flooding issues. Also, we're down here at, at Draw 7 Park. And as many of you know, there's a CSO regulator over there. And CSOs carry both uh, drainage water as well as sanitary sewage. So you can imagine we have more rainfall in our storms. We're going to see more overflows into the Mystic River here. One of the major sources of contamination to the Mystic River is so-called non-point source pollution or stormwater runoff. And this is runoff that flows over our streets and yards, etc. 
Well, it picks up a lot of the dirt and pollutants in the streets and yards, oil and grease, and all goes into the river. So if we have more storms, more rain flushing into the river, we have more, more pollutants going into the river. Also, we have more overflows of combined sewers. The only thing that's going to happen to the river is the river's going to be warmer, because the atmosphere is good, because the air is going to be warmer. Warm water holds less dissolved oxygen than cooler water. So we have less dissolved oxygen in our rivers. Uh, we need plentiful oxygen in our rivers to support healthy, healthy ecosystems. So the only thing that's going to happen to our quality of rivers is we're going to have lower flows in the summer. And even though we're going to have more rainfall, that rainfall is going to be more durable. So in the summer, we're generally going to have lower flows in the river than we have right now. Also, the flow is going to be more variable, more highs and more lows. Now, that's crucial to understand. That is, <coughs> averages don't tell you the whole story. On average, we're going to have more rainfall, and every one rainfall event is going to have more rainfall. But there are going to be more lows as well, more drought periods. And what they call the flashiness of streams is going to increase. There's going to be huge downpours, and there's going to be a flood, and then there's going to be drought. Flood, drought, flood, drought. Higher temperature of the water, less dissolved oxygen, more algae blooms, and in fact, less supported fish life in the water because the oxygen levels aren't high enough. And then in these storm events, there's a combined sewer overflow. The CSO drains right back out into the river. That is, the sewers will flow back into the river. It's an extraordinary series of combinations that Paul Kirshen very clearly has in mind here. So overall, the quality of this river is going to suffer. Um, another thing that's going to happen to our water is uh, we're going to have higher sea levels. And we could see maybe um, one to two feet of higher sea levels in the next, uh, by 2050, and as much as three to six, three to six feet by uh, 2100. And um, so, you know, what's that mean? Well, over here, the, uh, you can see the high water mark right now. So if you add like uh, three or six feet on top of that, you can see that this area of the dam is just going to be overtopped every high tide. And don't forget a storm, like a nor'easter or, or a hurricane, and you have like four or five feet on that because of a storm surge, you're going to have flooding all in this area here. And you actually could flood the area where they're doing all the development in Assembly Square. When we think about it, you know, all our infrastructure is designed to deal with climate, like all roads are designed to handle a certain amount of drainage. All buildings are designed for a certain amount of heating and cooling. Well, if all that's changing, the operation and effectiveness of all this infrastructure is going to change as well. Well, that's the crucial thing. I mean, he's basically a civil engineer, not a climate scientist. And it's crucial to keep that in mind. He's not speaking about what's predicted from the climate end of things. He's reading what the climate scientists say and say, listen, if that's the case, as a civil engineer, I'm concerned about that. Why? Well, because I build roads and bridges and dams. Right? That's what they asked me to do as a civil engineer. That's what I train students to do. But as he points out, all civil engineering is built to specifications. As he says, when you think about it, <laughs> when you think about it, it's really quite staggering as an insight. Let's look at it again, because it's very crisp and said almost offhandedly, but the implications are staggering. When you think about it, you know, all our infrastructure is designed to deal with climate, like all roads are designed to handle a certain amount of drainage, all buildings are designed for a certain amount of heating and cooling. Well, if all that's changing, the operation and effectiveness of all this infrastructure is going to change as well. Right. The operation and effectiveness, when you think about it, is going to change as well. Well, this is what he inspired other people to start to look into. First at Tufts, then he was at the University of New Hampshire, and now he's at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And he was behind a lot of the climate change and sea level rise projections for Boston, the study that a group called the Boston Research Advisory Group, or BRAG, um, developed the Bragg Report in June 1st, 2016. So, 
UMass Boston, with Paul Christian at the head, came up with a plan that informed the mayor and others. UMass Boston was honored with medals by the Leventhal Environment Board in this. He and the former student of his, Ellen Douglas, basically received the Norman D. Leventhal Award for the Environment for their excellent work in this and mapping out what's coming. It was he who informed the mayor's energy and environment. This latest push is nothing new for the hub. Massachusetts has been working to become climate ready for more than a decade. And this morning we're giving you a closer look at just what that means. That was Boston then. This is Boston now. Imagine what Boston would look like in 30 years. If we had a large storm in 2050, then this would actually be an island a little bit here. That's Austin Blackman. He's the chief of environment for the city of Boston. Where we would be right now would actually be, we would be probably closer to waste, between our waist and our shoulders in terms of where water would be. He's talking about the potential impact of sea level rise to Christopher Columbus Park in the North End. Well, it was precisely in that area that just this, this last month, WGBH2, Boston. This happened. Tonight on Greater Boston, massive storms bring once in a lifetime flooding to Boston twice in eight weeks. What's the city and region doing to protect us from future storms, and is it enough? Plus, your government in action, not in action, but in action, with Congress apparently having no interest in taking up immigration reform, gun control, or any major issue for that matter is just going to be eight more months of sitting around doing nothing through the midterm elections and later. And later. Well, this, in effect, the mayor recognized. Right, one day after the storm, and it was a very rough day for the city of Boston yesterday. On the phone right now, we've got Mayor Marty Walsh with us. Thanks so much for joining us, Mayor. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me this morning. So I guess the first question we want to ask you about is the flooding uh, all along the seaport. What's the situation now uh, from your understanding, and how how is the flooding now? It, you know, last, yesterday afternoon when the high tide came in, you know, it really uh, it caught a lot of neighborhoods by surprise. Uh, the North End, South Boston Waterfront, Charlestown, East East, Dorchester, and um, you know, it, it did some damage, uh, but we were able to handle it where we didn't have to evacuate anyone. Uh, and certainly, we're going to go back and assess any damage that's there today. Uh, but it was something that that was a, a problem. And, and shows it's a thing that we have to look out for in the future now in our city. Yeah, we have to look out for it. Here's the aquarium subway stuff with water coming in from the sea. Right? This is not a puddle outside. This is the ocean that's coming down the stairs of the aquarium subway stop. Right. Well, as he put it yesterday afternoon, a lot of neighborhoods <laughs> were caught by surprise. Well, winter storms, though less powerful than hurricanes, may be more devastating, is the judgment of the professor of public health or with the Harvard School of Public Health. We're in real trouble here, as she's pointed out. And now, even Yankee Magazine has a cover story, The Coast is Changing, Can New England Adapt, is their question rising seas. Well, the problem is, it's not going to go away. It's in fact happening even more rapidly because of what's happening. 10% of Antarctica's coastal glaciers are retreating. New study results published in Nature Geoscience are cause for concern. They hint at the massive contributions of melting glaciers to global sea level rise. Antarctica stores enough ice to raise sea levels by more than 60 meters. The mostly submerged glaciers rest deep on the sea floor at a point called the grounding line, where ocean, ice, and bedrock meet. So the grounding line is the place where the glacier detaches from the bed and becomes a float with the ocean. And as it becomes a float in the ocean, we see the retreat of the grounding line on the glacier as it's being melted more strongly by the ocean. And you see that the bed of the glacier slopes uh, inland it never gets away from the water. The water keeps following the glacier because it gets deeper inland. New data results found 10.7% of these glaciers are moving at a significant speed back towards the center of the continent as they melt from below. Okay, and they melt from below. 
taking that water into the ocean. This is why climate change in Boston is being determined by events halfway around the world, and we need a new kind of citizen science alliance to look at this. Thank you.